Good afternoon, everyone. It's two o'clock. I have no idea what day or date it is. Um, if you're anything like me, the only way you know what day it is is from the little date on your pillbox. Um, but apart from, uh, from but apart from that, a, a huge welcome from uh, us at the Centre of Organisational Resilience at University of Lincoln. Uh, I'm going to host today and try and keep us on time. I'm joined by Kate, Philippa and Rachel. Uh, a multidisciplinary panel and I like to think and hopefully you'll agree by the end of it that when we think about mental health productivity in its most holistic terms that's when we're going to have really positive impacts that's when we're going to really see the benefits um, a lot of organizations and a lot of people think about mental health and mental our, our own sort of mental and, and normal well-being in terms of a deficit model so we think about how do we fix things when they go wrong when things aren't working particularly well and hopefully again by the end of today's session we'll give you an introduction we'll give you some information we'll give you some tips on how we can be proactive. So we move into something that is more proactive, more front-footed really, rather than that kind of idea of a deficit model. I hope that I won't talk an awful lot. I'm gonna leave that to my three colleagues. Um, but what I would challenge each and every one of you um, out there in the big wide world to do is jump on the chat um, mechanisms, let us know that you're there. Um, let us know if you've got any questions, if there's anything in particular that you really want to know. Um, but also one of the things that, that we're all really big uh, and interested um, in is, is co-creating our learning today. So I don't think any of our colleagues will confess to having all of the answers or all of the great tips. So what I'll ask you to do is in the chat, if you know something in your regional area that's maybe a, a great organisation, We've got a top tip um, that will really help in terms of nutrition, movement or productivity, then, then please do add it in the chat and we'll, um, we'll chat about those as we go through. Um, before we start, uh, this is a, a general introduction. Um, it is an information, uh, it's the start of a conversation and hopefully between us and you uh, at the start of a great relationship in moving um, this important agenda forward if you or somebody that you know does need urgent help urgent support holly my colleague um who's behind the scenes keeping us all on track is going to put some links in the chat uh forums for you so if you need that please do access that um it's really really important if you need help and support then uh, then you reach out and get that Okay, so I'm going to shut up um, and I'm going to hand over to Kate, Kate from the University of Derby. Kate, I just wonder whether or not you can maybe run us through why now is a great time to invest in people's mental health, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So um, just by way of introduction, Sally, and then I'll dive into the slides just so people can see my face, first of all. Um, yeah, so I'm um, Sally's equivalent. We both lead on the mental health and productivity pilot. So I'm from the University of Derby and my background is sort of 20 years in the mental health field. And I think mental health has always been there. Um, but I think with the pandemic, it has just sort of amplified and pushed mental health up that priority list for employers in particular, because we've all had to adapt to a new way of working. Um, and there's, there's been additional pressures um, from that. So my presentation, when I share my slides, just to make everybody aware, there's a short video at the beginning, um, just to set some context and actually answer the question that you've just uh, presented to me, Sally. But just in terms of a trigger warning, it does talk about mental health. It does talk about um, suicide, self-harm. And going through today, if there are any trigger points, as Sally pointed out, um, gonna be, there's going to be some links shared in the chat. So please do reach out if you do need any support. So I shall try and share my screen now, Sally, if that's all right. <laughs> Perfect. That's 
Fab Kate, thank you very much. Oh, it's all gone quiet. Are you there, Kate? Somebody was telling me the other day that um, that these sort of Zoom chats and these things now are, are just a, a modern day seance. You spend most of your time asking if anyone's there and if they feel like connecting, then uh, then please join in. Kate, are you are you there? While Kate's while Kate's just sort of working out her slides, maybe one of the things that I'd really um, like to challenge everybody then is if we're thinking about impact, if you know you've given up an hour of your really busy lives, um, you want to make a difference, obviously, and so do we. So what I'm going to challenge you towards the end of the session is to think about one thing maybe that you're going to do differently as an individual, as a you know from a personal level, and also one thing that you like to do differently for your work. Place, whether that's your workplace at home um, or whether or not um, you know that's that's sort of a workplace um, whenever we get back to to whatever new normal is are you good to go okay as long as you can hear me Sally I think I'm good to go I can hear you fabulous that's always a good start okay so just to provide some context let's share this video After I had the conversation with my manager, Adrian, it was a mixture of emotions. There was a significant amount of relief that, that someone else knew what was happening to me. There was a fair amount of fear because I think it meant that I was having to face something that I'd been ignoring to the best of my abilities was happening but overwhelmingly I think it was relief that that perhaps there was an end to this or that there was a way out um, that there was a way to make it stop work through lunches, I'd get home later, I'd work a, pretty much every evening. You don't always say what the cost is, what the personal cost is. There was this constant sensation of just trying to get by. I was overwhelmed by everything that was going on. I just really was wanting to keep everything under control and fix everything myself. And, and the reality is that I couldn't. I think if I look back on on good things that I've done, that's probably one of the best. Because I was I was in an absolute state. I was suicidal and I was really not coping. And I think it would have been very easy to just give up at that point. And I think what Adrian did was make me realise that there was help. I don't know how, if he realises how important it was to me and what a difference it made. Okay, so every time I watch that video, um, it always gets me a little bit. And I always think that we all need an Adrian in the workplace um, to sort of help us and really just to set some context and to pick up on a few points that Sally's mentioned. Mental health and well-being, they're getting increasingly recognised as important issues. 
And a statistic that's often bandied around and, and, and quoted in a number of places is that one in four adults will experience a mental illness at some point each year in the UK. And I think add that to the COVID um, pandemic as well. And some recent research that was um, carried out by Public Health England as well, 49% of adults have actually said that the pandemic has had a negative impact on their, on their mental health. And although the prevalence of mental health is, um, is, is there, it's, quite, it's, it's significant, there's not going to be many of us that don't know somebody that's struggled or indeed we've struggled ourselves. Team that with modern working life, which is always chaotic, um, packed with lots and lots of new pressures, new technology. You would think after a year working on teams, working from home, that we would have webinars really seamless. But there's always an issue with volume. There's always an issue with something else. And those are just added pressures that we've all had to deal with. And with the pandemic, we've extended our reach. We're not just working nine to five. I think the home working, remote working has really had an impact. In, and those lines have been blurred a little bit between work and home. First and most importantly, help should be made available to individuals of times in times of need. And employers are in the best possible position to act as that preventative um, measure. So, like Sally said, we want to get in before things um, escalate, before issues arise, and indeed before staff have to take any time off sick or have long term absence, etc. So, employers need a happy, healthy workforce to have the, the best productivity possible. And so that's why it makes so much sense for employers to get involved now in mental health and wellbeing of their workforce. They're really, they're really in a good position to start a conversation with their staff. And that can sometimes be quite daunting in starting that conversation. But actually, there are loads and loads of tools out there, the Samaritans tool being just one of them that can assist. So if we want a happier, healthier workforce, the, the days of having a health and wellbeing policy collecting dust on the shelf, that really has got to change. It can't just be a tick box exercise. And the mental health and productivity pilot is really designed to do just that. And in the first phase of our research, these were some of the stats that, that came out. We spoke to just under 2000 employers. And as you can see there, only 8.8 percent of employees would actually confide in their employer. And I think it's really interesting at this point to make that distinction. There's a responsibility on the individual to talk to their line manager because obviously line managers can only deal with what they what they're presented with but equally your your employer has a duty of care as well to make sure that the workplace is as happy and as healthy and as supportive as possible so the little word called pandemic that back in 2019 when the mental health and productivity pilot first came about we'd not even heard of covid19 and obviously it's brought a huge amount of additional pressures to us as a workforce and it's really elevated mental health up that priority list so as I mentioned previously 49% of adults have actually said that they've that the pandemic has impacted negatively on their mental health and that is from a range of sort of feeling anxious feeling quite isolated stress depression sleep issues homeschooling that that was a mammoth task in the early days I'm sure as well for many and so what we need to do is move away from businesses sort of diminishing mental health and um, I guess having that tick box culture so businesses that feel that they've got a health and well-being policy in place and that's sufficient we really need to change that way of thinking and, and, and change that culture and make a positive difference to encourage employers to really open and create that open and transparent supportive culture that really encourages people to talk about their mental health 
So the Mental Health and Productivity Pilot is funded by the Midlands Engine and it is indeed the pilot that myself and Sally are, are, part, are partners of, we're part of the consortium. We've also got the mental health charity Mind, West Midlands Combined Authority and it's Coventry University that's leading on the pilot. And what this aims to do is to deliver a step change in each of the nine LEP areas. So, for example, I'm looking after the D2 NT region, the Stoke and Staffordshire and the Marches, so Herefordshire, Shropshire, Telford and Rekin. And the aims of the pilot are to reduce absence and presenteeism, therefore leading to higher levels of productivity. And what we really want to do is help to reduce that stigma to ensure that, that staff feel supported and able to open up about any mental health issues that they might be struggling with and indeed that managers and workplaces feel confident in starting those conversations with staff but also providing that consistent support and as Sally uh, mentioned right at the beginning it's that preventative route so what the what the pilot is actually doing is working with businesses and there are a couple of couple of routes that businesses can can go down really they can either do a thrive at work accreditation program or they can do make the mental health at work commitment and we support them in rolling out mental health initiatives such as every mind matters this is me and in fact that video you saw right at the beginning is part of that this is me toolkit and all of the pilot is underpinned by the mental health at work course standards and regardless of which route you as a business take, whether that's the accreditation program or indeed whether it is just making the commitment and rolling out some initiatives across your workforce, these core standards are really poignant and they underpin everything that you do. So it's about prioritising mental health in the workplace. It's about developing awareness amongst your staff. It's about promoting an open culture and really setting that culture from the top down. A number of businesses I've been working with have really been quite creative and innovative in doing this. And senior managers have actually disclosed their own struggles with mental health, which has really assisted in opening up those conversations at work and actually other staff that perhaps were quite um, reserved or indeed worried about disclosing any mental health issues. It's actually really helped them. And we're really trying to increase the confidence of an organisation and the confidence of managers in opening up those conversations and then supporting their staff. And what, what, how we're doing that is through a range of mental health support tools, resources, sector specific toolkits. So for the education sector, frontline workers, the construction industry, there's a whole host of resources available. The benefits, and I don't usually like to talk about money and mental health, I don't like to combine the two. However, businesses will be saying, but by doing all this preventive stuff, what are we going to be getting from this? It's actually a return of £5 for every pound spent on mental health. I think we need um, an alternative there for the time spent because the mental health and productivity pilot is completely free to take part in as an organisation. Um, so prevention rather than reactive that is the key and actually the biggest return on investment has come from raising awareness of mental health in the workplace providing the relevant training and really investing in that culture shift um, or indeed enhancing what organizations have already got what's also important as well is if obviously we can't avoid all of the issues that people face um, we can't solve all the problems and this is by no means asking employers to become counsellors or to solve everybody's problems. What it is asking is though to be empathic, um, be supportive, be consistent in the support that you offer and if people do need to take time off from the workplace to have a really effective and supportive back to work plan in place and I think that's very easy when it comes to physical health problems. But when it comes to mental health, that can sometimes be a little bit of a grey area. And we sometimes struggle or feel, I guess, not so much confidence in, in our ability to pull a plan together in terms of how to support somebody with mental health issues coming back to the workplace. And so the mental health and productivity pilot can support every step of the way. So either before we have any issues, during and then after.
as well. These are the contact details of all of the universities in your area that are leading on the mental health and productivity pilot. I've put the relevant areas on there. Um, I've also put Sally's details on there as well, being in charge of Lincoln, Leicestershire and Rutland. And Sally, I think we're taking questions at the end, but I'm more than happy for anybody who's got any questions to sort of to shout out now. Brilliant. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, please do put your um, questions in the chat if you have any sort of, as I say, top tips, things that you really love. I think the important thing for me as well, and Elena makes the point in the chat about the impact being holistic is it's not just about workplace as well, right? It's about making an impact for that person. You, you know, the film said it really beautifully. We all, we all need an Adrian once in a while. But also it's not just about the positive impacts in the workspace. It's their family, it's the friends, it's those kind of ripple effects that actually make not just ourselves as individual or workspaces better but actually society as a whole uh, and I think you know over the last couple of years that's definitely become more and more important and I think again you know you, you raise some really really great points about actually employers can can just help to raise awareness can just help to reduce the stigma and, and help people to make informed choices now one of the areas that i really really struggle with and i'm hoping rachel's going to help out here it is on the old diet nutrition i don't know i don't know what's what i don't know what i can eat what i can't eat anymore rachel i'm sticking to the fact that i read an article once that said red wine was good for your brain so i'm sticking <laughs> with that and you're not going to change my opinion on that one but but rachel i'm just wondering can you can you kind of give us some information about how nutrition can help holistically uh, and especially with with sort of mental well-being? Yeah, basically, I think for me, um, nutrition is it's how you fuel your body. And ultimately, whatever fuel you put in is the good fuel you put in is the good you get out. So so everything that happens in your life is impacted on what you eat, be it how you think, how you move, how you feel will all be dictated to about what you've eaten because ultimately that's your fuel it's a bit like you wouldn't think to power a formula one car with chip fat for example because you want that dynamic fuel so it is kind of the same analogy with humans if you know if you want good energy and good productivity and good mental health you ultimately have to fuel your body to support the body to do that for you so if that clears it up a little bit <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that, that's fab. Thank you very much. And again, sometimes yeah, I kind of think, you know, I've I've done that eating too much and feeling like, oh, I can't move. There's nothing else I can kind of do. So it's knowing those those links. Rachel, are you happy to kind of go through, um, you know, some other information that people might find useful? Yeah, totally. Happy to do that. So thank you for bringing my slides up. Thank you, Holly. So, yeah, so basically, um, who am I? So why am I here talking to you today? So I'm Rachel Linson and I run a company called Firecracker. And my philosophy is around sparking energy in business um, with a focus around food and nutrition. But I also have a master in workplace health and well-being. I qualified a personal trainer over 15 years ago. And my background is in food and drink. So I'm in everything about food and drink and nutrition is what I'm all about. And my view is if you've got healthy employees you have happy employees and if they're happy they're more productive and the best way to start that is by putting the right fuel in um and let me make sure my slides work so my view is you know if you eat beige food you get beige mood and and that really sums up what i'm going to talk about is you know we you don't if you put the food into your body that maybe fuel you in terms of calories but doesn't fuel you nutritionally then you can't expect to have the energy and the output you would want. So again, with the racing car analogy. And the reason why we talk about that one thing around food is it's not just thinking about your mental health, but thinking about your gut as well. And the microbiome, which I'll explain what that is in a second, your microbiome, your gut and your brain axes is a developing area of science where we are truly understanding that our gut is autonomous. It's only other organ than our brain that has its own brain. It is like a second brain. So we often use the phrase, a gut feeling, or I've got butterflies in my belly when I'm nervous about something. 
And actually, the reason that is, is because our, our gut has a brain, it's autonomous, it can, it, it can do its own thing, it doesn't need the brain to, to tell it what to do. Um, and it, that's becomes really important when it comes about mental health, because ultimately, then that can affect how you how you function, how your mental, how your mental health is, is based on what's going on in your gut. And so within the gut, um, you have something called our microbiome. So we are actually more bacteria than we are human. And our microbiome is basically uh, the, the ecology um, within your digestive system. And this is made up of microorganisms or bacteria. We have good and bad. Um, and the good stuff helps to helps with digestion, but it also helps with um, creating hormones, most of our immune systems in our gut as well. So making sure our microbiome is happy is a really good place to start um, because if our microbiome is happy and we do know there is research that the, the type of bacteria you have in your, in your stomach and the diversity of that bacteria are indicators for health and long-term health as well. Um, and we do know within our modern lives in terms of, you know, we have less fiber in our diets now. We don't spend less time outside. We have more stress. We we are more sanitized than ever before. So we aren't really setting ourselves up to give our bodies the bacteria it needs to survive in a, in, in a, in a positive way. One thing that we can't, I can't do about anything about is stress. So stress is in our lives. And stress actually is a misnomer to me because actually what stress is, is it's just a physiological reaction that our body has when we feel that we're in a life or death situation. But the one thing related to food and mental health is, and digestion is when we are stressed. So when we are, in theory, running away from that saber toothed tiger or that tribe that's trying to kill us, um, we don't need to digest our food. Digestion is a non-life um, affirming kind of process. So when you are in that stress, so when you are in that flight or fight response, that physiological response to danger, your body will just switch off your digestion like that. So if you the one tip I can give you around stress is if you're having a stressful day, um, I would suggest when you eat your dinner, try and eat in a non stressed environment, give yourself at least 20 minutes to eat sitting down as well, because when we're stood up, we're ready for action. And our bodies then go, well, you're ready for action. So you don't need to be digesting your dinner again. So sitting down in a non stressed environment and eat your food. And that will give your body the opportunity to digest that food and absorb the nutrients from it. Um, so I can't take away stress, um, but I can suggest having that 20 minute lunch break away from your screen so you can focus on the food you're eating and allow the body to benefit from the nutrients it gets, which ultimately will then help you to, to have better mental health. So the first thing around thinking about brain is sugar. And now we don't necessarily need sugar as in sugar as sucrose. Um, our body needs glucose, which is our primary energy source. So we break down all our food into glucose and then glucose becomes um, gives us the energy we need. Um, the reason I'm talking about sugar is because it's very prevalent in our diet. And just because you don't see sugar on the ingredients list, don't be fooled that it isn't sugar. That list of 56 names um, are all the different things of sugar. So if it's got a toes at the end of it, so if you think of sucrose, which is our white sugar we have in the bags that we add to our tea and coffee, um, and it got a, a toes at the end of it. That indicates that it's a sugar molecule of some. So you've got your fructose, your galactose, um, your fructose, your lactose, for example, from milk. So they are sugar, and they um, are broken down into molecules of glucose, which you then use as as energy. But they can, if you have too much, our body doesn't like having too much sugar in its blood, so it will take out our blood into our cells, and then we have too little blood in our cell, in our too little sugar in our blood. And then we pump out. So we have that um, pump out um, uh, insulin. That's the one. So, you know, we start having these like energy fluxes. And if you ever have children or you have um, a good way to show these energy fluxes of sugar is Haribo. So you give a child a small bag of Haribo. They run around like a fruit loop. They're having a sugar high and then they have a tantrum and they've got a sugar low. And this is not really a very conducive to productivity because our bodies it's a quite a stressful process that's going high and low in energy with sugar. So I would suggest try and reduce your sugar intake. Um, you can use sugar alternatives like stevia and xylitol, 
which are sweet to the taste buds, but not as sugar as in the as in the traditional what we think is a glucose molecule. So our body process them different, differently. So we don't necessarily get that sugar high and sugar low with stevia and xylitol. However, what I would suggest is just trying to train your brain to be less dependent on sugar. So reduce your sweet tooth. And you can do that quite effectively. If anybody on the on the on the call at the moment has given up sugar in their tea, they will know how quickly your body will get used to not having sugar in your tea and you go back to have sugar in your tea and it's a bit horrible and it's not very um, conducive to enjoying. So it is about like kind of weaning yourself off sugar. It's also really important to stay hydrated. Um, we always hear the thing about two litres a day and uh, really it is because our bodies not only are we made of fat, mostly fat, we're made of water. Um, and so we we need hydration and just at eight, just a five or six percent dehydration rate will have an impact on brain function. And the best way I can talk about hydration is checking out your wee. I know that sounds a little bit weird and a bit strange and probably not very pleasant. But ultimately, our wee will is a really good indicator. And as you can see on the slide, your target you want is to be about a three by early evening. So I often refer to this as it looks like a really good glass of Chardonnay. Um, it probably doesn't taste anything like Chardonnay. I appreciate that. But that's kind of you're looking for a good glass of white wine um, as an indicator of, of your hydration levels. And really use your wee as a good indicator because your body's great at telling you what it needs. Um, and hydration is a definite fact. It doesn't just have to be water. It can be um, it can be hot drinks if you want to, like herbal infusions. It can be tea and coffee as well. But obviously that with caffeine in them, they can be a stress inducer. So they're, they can induce a stress reaction in the body. So we would suggest reducing them. It can be watered down fruit juice. Um, it can be cordial, wheat cordial. So don't just think it has to be water. And you don't actually have to drink it either. So if you're having lots of fruit and veg, a lot of fruit and veg are made up of water as well. So you could eat your, heat your water as well as drink it, if that makes sense. So like I said, our brain is quite high in fat. So we want to look at, we want some good fats in our diet. So the major fats we tend to have is our saturated fat, mainly from animal source, but also remember coconut and palm are also saturated fats. And then, and these are the ones that you, you want a little bit in our diet, but not too much. Um, and then you have your unsaturated fats, which are your um your mainly your vegetable source fats and in that you have your something called essential fatty acids now essential fatty acids are your omega-3 and 6 oils and their class is essential is because we need to get them in our diet we cannot make them in our bodies from other things so a lot of our a lot of the nutrients we, we have in our diet we don't necessarily need a certain nutrient we can process it and transform it from other things but when something's an essential like these fatty acids we do need them from our diet so omega-3 and omega-6 is, is the two places, two ingredients, two nutrients we really need. And the way I remember them, and this is very crude, but it's a simple answer, is omega-3 comes from the sea and omega-6 comes from trees. So mainly the omega-3 oils come from oily fish. Um, and then a major, most of the omega-6 um, fatty acids come from nuts and seeds. So that's kind of a crude way, but including some of that in your diet every week would be fantastic. And I would just say, I personally don't believe that you should, there's no good or bad foods, all foods all foods are good and bad. It all depends on how much you eat and how often you eat them. But the one thing I would say is try and avoid trans fats. Now trans fats are hydrogenated fat, which is a process that we've developed within the food sector to turn a vegetable fat to have the properties of a saturated fat. Um, so that we can make nice food, basically. But what they found recently is our body cannot understand it. So when the when this fat's been transformed, our body doesn't know what to do with it and tends to lock it up into into our cells, or it it sticks it to our arteries of our heart. And there is research suggesting that this this we don't get rid of it. You can't dispose of it. Our body just goes like I don't know what that is. I'm just going to put it somewhere and forget about it. So if you can avoid hydrogenated fat, then that's a great one. Most of the UK supermarkets have removed most of it from their food products. So, so it's not very readily available now, but it's just being mindful. We want our vitamins and minerals and the major ones we're looking about, about mental health and to improve our brain function are our B vitamins. So you've got your folic acid, folic acid or folate, your B6 and your B12. And all of these are really around energy production and neurotransmitter 
formation. So these these nutrients really help with with how you produce your energy. So you can give your your energy, your brain good energy, but also how we produce the neurotransmitters. And some of those neurotransmitters are things like serotonin, which is our feel good chemical. So these these vitamins and where we get these vitamins from is mainly the husk of the grain. So whenever you have in your your carbohydrates, be that fat, sugar, um, be that pasta, rice or bread, then we would suggest getting whole grains because the B vitamins are in the husk of the grain. So you want to eat the husk of the grain to get the B vitamins. And then some of the antioxidants, some of the in nutrients that are other nutrients are your antioxidants, your minerals and your fibres. So in terms of your things like zinc, chromium, selenium, magnesium, calcium are all featured in, in terms of, again, energy production, brainwave function, neurotransmitters um, and antioxidants. Now, antioxidants are when we have chemical reactions in our bodies, often we have something called free radicals. Now, free radicals called damage. So a bit like when a piece of when a bit if you think of when you have a piece of metal, and it gets wet, it goes rusty. Well, that's what happens when we have chemical reactions in our bodies. And that's happening all the time. And free radicals are produced, which cause damage to our cells. And so what we can do is eat things that are called antioxidants. And so they stop the, at the oxidative damage that these free radicals do. Most antioxidants come from fruit and veg. Um, so we would suggest that you eat um, a rainbow of fruit and veg every day. So I always think that what you want to do is eat seven portions of fruit and veg a day. A portion is 80 grams and try and eat all the different colors of the rainbow. Um, and the, the, pot, the pot of gold at the end of that rainbow is good health. Um, and also those fruit and vegetables give you loads of antioxidants. But they also give you fiber. And the reason fiber is so important to our diet. So not only does it help with things like um, digestive health, but with fiber, you have two you have soluble and insoluble fiber. Now, soluble fiber helps do things like boost. I won't go too much into into bowel movements, but it boosts the stools. It helps us pass our stools easier. The insoluble fiber uh, basically feeds our good bacteria. So we help if we eat in fiber and insoluble fiber specifically um, found in things like artichokes and onions and chicory, for example, they all help feed our good bacteria. So that's always a benefit to having fiber in your diet. And here in the UK, most adults don't eat enough fiber. Um, so if you can get fiber in, so that's again eating like the you know eating skins of, of vegetables so only literally not peeling vegetables when you're having them literally either have them with skins on or give them just a real kind of I usually just use a scouring pad so I just take off the top layer but I'm leaving most of the fiber within the skin and then protein so protein um helps with in terms of again looking things like serotonin so we make serotonin from something called tryptophan so tryptophan is naturally found in Turkey. So we have tryptophan, which we then convert into serotonin. So we do need our protein in our diet. That can be both plant or animal source. Um, but when it comes to so plant source, really obvious, you know, from plants, but from animal source, don't forget about fish. Don't forget about selfish. Don't forget about game either. You know, these feed, these plant based, these animal based proteins are fantastic sources, um, good quality, locally sourced. Um, and will help you help your brain function as well because we're given it some nutrients and chemicals it needs to, to function well and I think that's me so I do have any if we have any questions and shout in the in the in the chat box or I will hand you back to Sally Rachel we are going to get a move on uh, do you see what I did there um, and so I, I think something that's really been quite interesting for me is that you know you always have this thing in your head of you are what you eat but actually you are what your body absorbs right so you can eat all sorts of things but if your body's not absorbing it um, then then you know that, that there's something completely different we are going to move on that's my second and only dad joke of the section to philippa who's going to take us through movement and and how movement can can have a positive impact on our on our well-being thank you and uh holly if you wouldn't mind putting up the slides so uh welcome thank you i'm so happy that uh, we're all here together today 
to talk about mental health. It is something that's close to my own heart. I've had my own journey with uh, mental health challenges from my teens when I lost a sibling in a sudden road accident. In my 30s, I nursed my firstborn child through a trip uh, with cancer. And, uh, and in my 40s, I encountered the menopause. Now, there's a whole other story attached to that. So I am a charter physiotherapist and, um, and I'm the director of Precision Limited. That is my online wellness platform. And so uh, I've got quite a lot of material that I'm going to, uh, to skip over briefly because it's been covered perhaps already in, to some degree. Uh, and so the challenges for employers dealing around mental health issues, 51% uh, of all work-related ill health uh, working days lost is due to mental health challenges. And so this is a huge, this is a huge challenge for, uh, for us. And, and so just to really point out that we're all somewhere on this mental health continuum. Uh, somewhere between health at one end and illness at the other. And I know that I fluctuate. <laughs> I'm, I'm rarely in one spot every day. But uh, we might be feeling sad or down, um, have fears and worries. And, and that was definitely something that I encountered around the time of menopause. Unexplained anxiety was something that took the rug out from under me. And, uh, and mood changes, highs and lows, uh, you know, and this isn't necessarily conducive to, uh, to being productive in the workplace. And so speaking to that menopause uh, piece, interestingly, this is a, you know, a biological cause of mood disturbance due to the fluctuating levels of estrogen in the blood and, uh, and common challenges that we face are around depression, anxiety, uh, loss of confidence and sleep. And anybody who spent a sleepless night knows it doesn't take many of those for you to start to feel a little under par. And so uh, mental well-being, what's it all about? Uh, what do we need to do in order to, to have this holistic picture of a, a healthy person? And top of the list, uh, top of my list anyway, is let's be active. Um, and it's, and I'll come to that in due course, but be mindful uh, is, is the other thing. And that has its origins in Buddhism. And, uh, and so I'm a certified yoga teacher and, and mindfulness practices are really embedded within that practice. Um, uh, Non-judgmental attitudes and, and really cultivating awareness. Um, and so connecting, uh, I heard something this week, friend power is more important than willpower. And I thought that was, that was fantastically true. Um, and so remembering to, to be generous and, uh, and appreciative and, you know, keep learning. Learn something new if, uh, if you can. Learn a language, uh, learn a musical instrument. And these are all really going to stimulate the brain to uh, to grow and develop now moving for mental health why why should we be moving for our mental health uh, and the answers come down to really the effects of movement on the brain and so we know that only light activity can increase the electrical activity in the hippocampus and the hippocampus in the brain is the center for learning memory mood and emotion. And so by undertaking activities as just as simple as walking, we can enhance the electrical activity in the hippocampus. And actually uh, consistently undertaking regular activity will increase the volume of the hippocampus. And so three times a week, 20 minutes, uh, walking, and they noticed in a study recently that uh, that would increase the volume. And so this just increases our cognition, improves our cognition and our creativity. And this is something that we want. And so a sedentary 20 year old will generate half as many ideas as an active 70 year old. Now that's not to be sneezed, that is it. So um, also we're looking at activity promoting a hormone called brain derived neurotrophic factor. And this has been described as fertilizer for the brain. 
And so the brain is like a muscle. It has plasticity. And so we need to use it. And in response, it will change, ignore it, and it atrophies like, like any muscle. And so we, in terms of the body, obviously, activity, is it's no surprise that it's good for your muscles and uh, strengthening the muscles, uh, mobilizing the joints and stretching the tendons and the ligaments is going to ultimately prevent aches and pains and uh, relieve joint stiffness and re re reduce our risk of uh, injury. And particularly in the workplace, we might be talking about uh, back issues, which are awfully common and repetitive strain. So uh, what kind of movement should we be doing? Well, I've already alluded to the walking and uh, ideally we should be walking every day. Uh, we should be moving to feel alive. And uh, in this fabulous sunshine we've got today here in Lincolnshire anyway, uh, I went out for a walk earlier and absolutely on the return, you're, you're much more productive and actually you're much more productive for about two hours afterwards. Um, and it doesn't have to be for very long, even just 15 minutes at lunchtime, get out into the air. Um, you know, maybe you're not commuting anymore, but you could walk to work or pretend to walk to work like I do and, uh, and get the benefits of the feel good chemicals uh, circulating through the brain. And resistance training actually has really significant effects on the brain the feel-good chemicals, the endogenous cannabinoids and the endogenous opioids are released when we do strength training. And also uh, increasing our physical capacity decreases our risk of injury, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So, uh, you know, what can we do if we're spending all day sat at a desk? Uh, get up, take regular breaks, uh, circle your arms around, do some squats and tiptoe raises and stand periodically. Uh, if you can, uh, you know, adopt a standing desk and uh, and on your way to the kettle, grab a hold of the top of the door frame and stretch out your shoulders. If you have a physically demanding job, then uh, we're talking about repetitive tasks, handling loads and repeated or sustained bending. And so the antidote to these kinds of uh, roles is to maintain the mobility of the joints the strength in the muscles and do restorative type movement practices such as yoga, which also incorporates relaxation and, uh, and have a good strong core so that we can protect the spine. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is a place for relaxation and deep breathing techniques. And even just six deep breaths can trigger changes in the sympathetic nervous system. And that is your fight or flight mechanism. So uh, so in a brief moment, six deep breaths, I'm sure we've all got time for that. So when when's a good time to get moving, I hear you ask? Well, early in the morning, exposing yourself to sunlight actually aids restful sleep. And so good sleep is going to, uh, is going to improve our capacity to deal with stresses and strains in our lives. And, uh, and actually, the daylight that you'll get outside is never is always going to be better than that you would get from a light bulb. So even if all you do is stand outside the door with your morning coffee, uh, then then that is going to improve your ability to sleep. Uh, embed movement in your day. So regular inputs, uh, little and often is is the way that I would talk about it, so that you have an opportunity to vary your position and the tasks that you're doing if possible. Uh, and, and then monitor movement with an activity tracker. Uh, and think about being somebody who relaxes actively. So um, how? How do we do this? How do we go about getting uh, more movement into our lives, into our day, into our work? Uh, and I came across recently an interesting article in the BMJ about something called the Goldilocks principle. And we will share this in the chat for anyone who's interested. But uh, that, you know, if at all possible, we want to get in at the design stage. And that is to design work that has just 
the right amount of sitting and that's where goldilocks comes in because if you remember the porridge was too hot no too cold no and then it was just right so we're looking for porridge that's just right just the right amount of sitting standing and moving arranged in a suitable uh, pattern and so physically active workers oftentimes have poorer health not better than sedentary workers and obviously there are socioeconomic health inequalities that play into that um, and actually it's possible that the Goldilocks principle could also be applied to the mental demands at work and have a positive impact on mental as well as physical health and so coming to bite-size opportunities what, what we do know from motivation theory is that small uh, we're much more likely to do something if it's packaged in a small package. And so habits will uh, be much more easily embedded into our lives if we start small. Five minutes. Think of uh, when you push the button on the kettle to boil, have a dumbbell handy to lift in the kitchen. And something as simple as that can set us on a journey to health and well-being, and, and yes, have one in your workplace too, or just do a few squats. Household chores, nobody's particularly thrilled by household chores, but it is an opportunity to get physical and get active. Um, and so if you think every time you sit down on a chair, do 10 squats before you actually come to rest, and maybe balancing on one leg uh, while you're on the telephone, something to just embed and incorporate movement into your day. Harness the power of technology. There's so much health tech around these days. And, uh, uh, you know, track your sleep, track your activity, uh, moments of rest, and also something called heart rate variability. Heart rate variability speaks to mental health. Um, it's it's indica indicative of our general state of a mind. And so there are some apps that you can track heart rate variability, for instance. Remember to celebrate success because positive emotions will help to reinforce behaviors. And, uh, and look to community. It may be that there are already health champions in your workplace who would be willing to lead a lunchtime movement session, for instance, a lunchtime walking group where people can get together and, and uh, you know, kill two birds with one stone, have a bit of conversation, maybe just two people at the moment. But uh, what we do know is that people who uh, buddy up are more likely to do move more and so 700 steps more each day actually uh, think about working smarter not harder uh, this is controversial perhaps but scientists generally agree that the ideal daily working uh, time is about six hours and so there's something called the pomodoro time management technique and uh, we'll put a link to that in the chat as well for everyone to have a look at so health promotion, what can we do? Start at the top, I think Kate mentioned that. Be genuinely interested in the well-being of our workforces, uh, the empathy, educate uh, people around this topic and involve staff in decisions. Uh, support healthy lifestyle choices and that I'm, I'm talking maybe about vending machines and such like and uh, harness the power of technology. And ultimately, we need to offer a variety of opportunities. So um, here with me at uh, Precision, I'm a virtual business, and uh, we have a lot of virtual opportunities that we am very happy to offer out to people. Um, and so if there's anything you would like to know from me, uh, please let us know in the chat. And thank you so much for your time today. And uh, and so taking us back to the group, thank you, Holly. Thanks, Philippa. I, um, it always uh, sort of it never ceases to amaze me. I, and you, you called it friend power, that sort of joint accountability, right? Mm -hmm. So I am more likely to go to the gym or go out for a walk if I promised a friend that I'm going to go with them because I don't want to let them down rather than maybe not wanting, you know, or not being quite so bothered to let myself down mm. um and, and and i sort of 
I, I think you're right. It's just those slight changes in little things that we can do and maybe workplaces can help um, because it's that kind of, it's a small change, but it's making a change. You know, we could all buy, you know, a stand up desk, but if it's just going to turn into another piece of furniture that, that I put my cardigan on, um, you know, like the exercise bike, then, um, then it isn't going to have made an awful lot of difference, right? Mm, right. So one question I've got for for the team, I'm 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 looking at the sort of chat. There's n there's no sort of questions in, as such coming through. So one question I've got just in the last couple of minutes is how about those people that don't work in an office uh, that maybe don't work on a on a sort of what I would call a, a manual job, so so on a building site or something like that. So I'm thinking bus drivers, lorry drivers. What what could they do? What would your what would your top tip be each for for maybe something that they could do? If I bring in Kate and then and, and then we'll we'll come to you, Philippa. <laughs> So, yeah, it's those more remote workers, isn't it, Sally, that seem to have um, issues. And, and as part of MHPP, that's been a, quite a few businesses have signed up where those workers, the communication's difficult. And so there's a really lot, there's a lot of online tools. So Every Mind Matters is a good tool to go on to. And it's not for when you're struggling. It's for, it's like prevention, again, like we've, we've raised, Sally. So Every Mind Matters is a really good tool. It's a five question quiz that you can just do. And it asks you about your sleep, about your, your well-being, your um, work-life balance. And then it gives you a, a mind map of a whole host of issues, like resources, signposting, guided meditations, etc. There's a whole host of things on there. So that would be a good tip. And do that on a regular basis as well. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Philippa, what would you recommend to that sort of group of people then? What what change could they make? Well, I mean, if you're talking about bus drivers, I, I have a bus stop quite near where I live and uh, the bus quite often stops there while they have their break. Uh, and what I do see, you know, hope uh, in the summertime is the bus driver gets out and stands on the pavement for a little while. Um, I suppose if I asked him to do a few star jumps while he was stood there, he, he, <laughs> that might just be very slightly uh, unnerving to the passers-by, mightn't it? But, uh, but yeah, definitely get out of the seat because sometimes, you, you know, it's tempting to just sit there, switch on the mobile phone and, uh, and, and continue. So any opportunities that you have to incorporate even just, um, you know, like I said, it, it could be just 10 10 squats and and the and you're done you know just any opportunity and then of course there are people with um delivery drivers i had my uh my uh somebody here oh a, a client of mine who is a delivery driver i was just trying to remember and and of course so they're sitting and then they get out and they've got to be quite physical all of a sudden uh, and so you're going from one extreme to the other when maybe you could do to just do a little bit of warming up before you start lifting those very heavy, um, you know, uh, boxes of, of groceries. So you, you've been sitting outside my house with the Amazon delivery person, haven't you? Rachel, what would you what would one piece of advice you give to to employers about how they can raise awareness maybe for for a healthier a healthier diet um you know in the workplace i think it for it is about empowering people with knowledge but in terms of you know making those little things it's things the thing that i think is the easiest thing to apply is healthy snacking so you know it is easy to just grab a, a chocolate bar or a packet of crisp but there are so many things that you could eat that you know can be a healthy snack and i see snacks as you know, they're micro meals basically so my micro meal my snack is kind of get me through to the next time I can have an opportunity to make a, be a better choice so my snacks I have during the day is like mid-morning mid-afternoon and in the evening um and so I always think about healthy snacking so that could be things like nuts and seeds are a great opportunity or nuts and dried fruit because it doesn't go hard even if you've got a man bag um they don't like go destroyed you know the last thing I know most people have had a banana in a handbag and like two or three days or weeks later, you find this kind of mush in the bottom. But things like yeah. nuts are great to have. Um, I'm a fan of 
things like beef and this is uh, not vegetarian or plant-based but things like beef jerky or you can get like little packs of salami now so pepperami or something like that again it's going to give you energy but it's not going to give you that sugar spike so it's about thinking about something that will give me energy and fill me up and keep me going but not going to spike my energy so i'm getting that sugar high so mainly fat. protein based and fat i would say so nuts and dried fruit are probably a perfect combination i'll give those a go and again i think sometimes it's about just taking a little step and doing something proactive rather than maybe cutting out food groups and and all those kind of random things so so even maybe just increasing my water intake with some fruit teas rather you know replacing some of that caffeine okay so we're nearly out of time i just want to thank uh, the panel and for holly our colleague in the background for putting all the information um out we will come back out with more information we will also come back out with information about other webinars that we're hoping to hold uh, on sleep on how to return back to the workplace so again keep your eyes <coughs> peeled for those um, I think today if we can maybe take anything away it's start the conversation and it doesn't have to be a massive thing it can be just something small and right at the beginning of the session I challenged you what would be the one thing that you're going to do differently at the end of today we all wanted that sort of positive impact so so think about that you can share it in the chat if you want to but i'm going to challenge you all to commit to a follow-up session with us in sort of six weeks time and, and we're going to be that that friend that that sort of accountability friend to see exactly what you guys have done differently and to hear all the great success stories and lastly, but by no means least, my huge thanks to everybody who's tuned in today. Uh, if for no other reason than you forced me to tidy up the office, because we don't have visitors to our houses anymore. I haven't had to tidy up for such a long time. So well done to you lot. Thank you very much. And, uh, and we hope to see you soon. Take care and keep well, everyone.